Good morning, my friend. I'm glad we could meditate God's word together. You know, to be blessed by God is an exhilarating experience. But there is something more desirable than God's blessing. So what is this something better? Guys, what I'm about to share with you is more intoxicating than receiving a promotion or a raise. Surprisingly, way better than receiving miraculous healing. Much bigger than finally having that long-awaited baby or that husband or wife. And people who tasted this something don't want to go back again, focusing on just God's blessing. And no, I'm not talking about salvation because that's already a given. So what is this something? To answer that, we will let those who tasted this something tell us their story. First on this list is Moses. In Exodus, Moses was leading more than two million former oppressed slaves into the promised land, into their American dream. Now, the idiom used in the Bible is to a land flowing with milk and honey. It is a poetic way of saying that God would bless them with a land that is so fertile, it takes two persons to carry one cluster of grapes. Milk and honey in this land were abundantly flowing because the livestock and bees that produce milk and honey have plentiful green grass, flowering trees, water resources, vast farmland, etc. And after being slaves for 430 years, who doesn't want God's blessings? But Moses said something shocking when they were about to enter the promised land. Exodus 33:15 says, And Moses said to him, or God, if your presence does not go with us, do not take us up from here. To put it differently, Moses politely asked God, if you don't go yourself, don't make us leave this place. I prefer to stay here in the middle of nowhere as long as I'm with you, rather than acquire blessings but without you. Now, what does this mean? It means that God's presence is more important and more desirable to Moses than God's blessings. Now, let me pause here and emphasize it again. God's presence is more desirable than God's blessing. That's what these people on the list discovered. Now, what does this mean? And how can we appropriate it in our lives? Now, before we answer these questions, let's go back to Moses' story. Now, why did Moses say that God's presence is more important than God's blessing? Because he knew that the absence of God's presence with them in their journey to the promised land would turn those blessings into serious problems, not only for them, but also for God's reputation. Now, how did he know this? Because he experienced in the first 40 years of his life that even though he was so blessed by God, for example, he grew up in the palace as the son of the Egyptian queen. He got the best education from the top Egyptian tutors. He has power that comes from being a prince. He has wealth, of course. Yet, yet his blessings and privileges as a prince put him into trouble because of something he did. And as a result, he became a fugitive, running for his dear life. And the next 40 years of his life, he was reduced into a nobody, staying hidden from everyone and from civilization, until God, in his mercy, came and rescued him. Now, how did he lose God's presence or companionship? Listen to this. It's a matter of lordship. You see, 
Moses wanted to be the master of his own life instead of submitting to the lordship of God. He followed his own path by killing an Egyptian, thinking that his plan was foolproof. So he lost God's companionship and became a fugitive. Thankfully, Moses learned his lesson. That's why here in Exodus 33, he is now more concerned with preserving God's presence than prioritizing God's blessings. The Israelites, on the other hand, refuse to learn this lesson. They won't submit to God's lordship. So God said in Exodus 33.3, Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, for you are a stiff-necked people, and I might destroy you on the way. In other words, God said, Yes, I will give you your blessings, but I won't give you my presence because you want to be your own lords. You only follow what you want. You are stiff-necked people. Of course, the only exception to this is Moses. While the Israelites were busy doing their thing, Moses would go out and enjoy his time with God. Exodus 33.7a says, Moses took the tent and pitched it outside the camp, at a good distance from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. Now, this is not the tabernacle, and the size and contents of this tent are not known. But what we know is that Moses enjoys this time with God more than anything else. Exodus 33:11a says, The Lord would speak to Moses face to face, the way a person speaks to a friend. Moses speaking face to face with God does not contradict the fact that he was not allowed to see God's face because face to face is a figurative expression that means openness and friendship. In short, he experienced something in that little tent that made all the appeal and glamour of the promised land pale in comparison. The intoxicating wonder of God's presence deadened all his desires for any material or physical blessings. Now, to be clear, God's presence and God's blessings are not mutually exclusive. But when faced with a decision to choose one, Moses, without missing a bit, would choose God's presence or lordship. Why? Why is God's presence better than his blessing? Now, before we answer that, another person who wanted God's presence more than God's blessings is David. First of all, he went through both extremes. On the one hand, he experienced extreme hardship and poverty. For example, he was living in caves, constantly running for his life because he was number one in Mossad's most wanted list almost half of his life. He has nothing proper to eat nine out of ten and even pretended to be mentally deranged by letting saliva round down his beard just to stay alive. On the other hand, when David's fortune changed when he became king and he has now unlimited access to wealth, power, and even women, yet the itch for God's blessings did not appeal to him that much. Something else consumed his soul more. What is it? Psalm 27, 4 says, The one thing I ask of the Lord, the thing I seek most. Now, can you feel his deep longing? Now, what is this thing that keeps him awake at night? The verse says, Is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Now, that phrase, house of the Lord, does not refer to Solomon's temple since it was not yet built. 
Also, he could not be referring to the tabernacle because non-priestly people cannot live there. So what does it mean? This phrase is again an idiomatic expression that means to be in God's presence. This is his number one ambition. Now, why does he want to spend the rest of his life in God's presence? The verse continues, So I can gaze at the splendor of the Lord and contemplate in his temple. Now, the words gaze and contemplate speak of David's desire to know God more so that he can align himself to his lordship. No wonder David is called a man after God's own heart or a man after God's own will. Because when God's will says, go to the left, then David goes to the left. When God says, go to the right, then David goes to the right. David found submission to God's lordship more appealing to him than any earthly pursuit. Now, in a nutshell, of all the things David could have asked, His number one longing was to be in God's presence all the days of his life. Now, this sounds weird considering that the situation in Psalm 27 is that he was surrounded by a host of enemies who threatened his life. Look at verses 2 and 3. When evil men attack me to devour my flesh, when my adversaries and enemies attack me, even when an army is deployed against me, even when war is imminent. However, instead of asking for God's blessing and protection, instead of praying that his enemies be removed, he asked to be in God's presence. In summary, he is willing to exchange the comfort of his palace into a small space, delighting in the Lord's perfections, and meditating in his presence. To sum it up, to desire God's presence means to desire his lordship. The main point of this message is to show men and women who find that submitting to God's lordship more enjoyable than God's blessing. They find companionship with God more rewarding than rewards. And even if following God means they will suffer, then they will gladly choose to suffer, such as the willingness not to go to the promised land if it needs to be. Now, other Old Testament people in the list who are more concerned with God's presence than God's blessing include Enoch, who walked with God. We have Joseph in Genesis, who was described all the time with the phrase, the Lord was with Joseph. We have Joshua, Daniel, and a host of others. Now, what's consistent among them? They prefer submission to God rather than blessings from God. To finish this list, let's look at a New Testament example. Let's look at this person's only one goal in life and the motivation behind everything he accomplished. Now, I'm referring to Paul. In Philippians 3.10, he spelled out his life's ambition. He said, My aim is to know him, to experience the power of his resurrection, to share in his sufferings, and to be like him in his death. Now, let's focus on that first line right now. He said, My aim is to know Christ. Well, does he not know Christ? Paul already knew Christ as his Savior. But here, listen, he wanted to know him more intimately as his Lord. Now, that last sentence, my friend, is what made Paul similar to previous examples I've given you so far. They all want to know God or Jesus as their Lord, not just as Savior. I know separating Jesus as Savior from Lord is an artificial dichotomy unheard of among biblical writers because if Jesus is your Savior, then He is also your Lord. It's a package deal. But because a lot of people nowadays heard and received Jesus only as their Savior, 
but not their Lord. They believe in an incomplete gospel. And as a result, they are missing a more complete experience with God. You see, viewing Jesus as your Savior only and not Lord is like having a powerful car. But you keep pushing the car as you go from one place to another because you don't know that you can ride on it. And by pressing the gas pedal, you can go faster and enjoy the ride. Did you realize what you are missing if you don't take Jesus as your Lord? To submit to the Lordship of Christ is the most exhilarating, the most exhilarating ride in your life. But will it be costly? Someone might ask. Will it be costly if I submit to the Lordship of Christ? The correct answer is, submitting to the Lordship of Christ is the best kind of life. There is no better way to live your life than to submit fully to the Lordship of Christ. It's called the Gospel, the Good News, because it's good. Moses experienced it. David experienced it. Paul experienced it. All people who experience an exhilarating life learn that submitting to the Lordship of Christ is better, is better than life and blessing themselves. They found out that it's way, way rewarding than rewards themselves. I cannot help but go back to Moses again. Hebrews 11 says, By faith, when he grew up, Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. In other words, he refused this blessing, choosing rather to be ill-treated with the people of God than to enjoy sin's fleeting pleasure. In short, he values submitting to the Lordship of Christ more. He regarded abuse suffered for Christ to be greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. For his eyes were fixed on the reward. Now what's the reward here? It's Christ. To know Christ. Moses is similar to Paul's ambition and all the other heroes of faith in Hebrews 11. They all want to know Christ experientially. Not just a savior from hell, but all want Jesus in the driver's seat as Lord and Master. This is more rewarding than pursuing God's blessings. My friend, are you focused on God's blessing more than God himself? Ah, you are missing a lot. Don't fall into that trap. Are you so engrossed in finding a relationship with someone? Are you so focused on praying that God will give you that next blessing? that next promotion, that next bigger pay, that bigger house. But how about desiring a better price? How about desiring to submit to the Lordship of Christ? From the few examples I've given you, this is better than any material and physical blessings from God. So the question now is, Pastor Juan, if submission to the Lordship of Christ is the best kind of life, how can I do that? Can you give me some practical ways on how to retrain my heart to pursue God himself? That's part two of this message. Come back next time. I intentionally withheld this part because I want to invite you to reflect deeper and study more the beauty of submitting to the Lordship of Christ. Look what happened to all the people in the Bible who submitted to God's exhilarating Lordship. But most importantly, I want to point you to Jesus himself. Before we will watch the second part of this message, spend your quiet time meditating on Jesus, his submission to the Father, and why this is the best life. I'll see you next time.